Thank you everyone for attending today's virtual open house for the graduate programs in spatial analysis uh, for public health. At this point, you should be able to see our screen with our first um, presentation slide. I'm Kelly Curtis, one of the admissions officers here in the department for the applied science programs. And I work with our team to assist students as they are exploring uh, their options for continuing their education. I would like to introduce both Frank Carrero, the program director, and Tim Shields, one of the professors. Uh, would you both like to share a little bit about uh, your backgrounds? Sure, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Kelly. Um, my name is Frank Carrero. I um, have been working in this field probably uh, um, about 25 to 30 years and um, it's an exciting field it, it's been evolving over the years that's for sure my my background is in statistics so I'm, I'm more of a biostatistician um, with a focus in in spatial analysis so analyzing maps and you'll hear a little bit about that today hi everybody i am tim shields my background is more in geography um, i came to hopkins maybe 25 years ago about um, and I guess through all these years, I've been just working on uh, GIS applications in, in public health, which kind of runs the gamut. And, uh, and so I was excited to put this uh, program together with Frank and um, kind of, you know, develop these courses to kind of address all these great topics. Thank you both for introducing yourselves. So today's agenda will include spatial analysis industry overview. Um, why these programs were designed, why these skills are needed, and what you could be doing in this field. Uh, program details will be covered both on the uh, graduate certificate and the master's. Uh, insight into the curriculum, uh, what online learning looks like here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health with our over 20 years of online experience. Uh, you'll hear about the level of support that we provide uh, faculty members will be highlighted uh, with their level of expertise. Uh, I'll cover the admission requirements, tuition, the partial OPAL scholarship, and touch on financial aid. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, please type them in the Q&A box, and there will be time uh, for questions and answers at the end of this presentation. Frank, feel free to start. Okay, yeah, so I was going to take it from here. And so let's start out really simple and, and talk about what is spatial analysis. Um, it's the interpretation of geographic information through the use of mapping software and statistical analysis. It builds on the foundations in both epidemiology and biostatistics. And our program takes a more of a comprehensive approach to um, teaching spatial analysis. We call this the spatial science paradigm and it, include, it includes components of spatial data, geographic information systems, and spatial statistics. So, I mean, you can think about spatial data as, you know, okay, I got to gather the information. I need the information. And this comes in a form of data. It's spatial data. So it has location information tagged to it or attached to it. Then we go to a geographic information system. And this is a GIS. And, and that helps us map the data, but not only just map the data, but integrate databases from different sources and, and spatially integrate them all into one, one system where we can map all that data together. And then we look to the field of spatial statistics to kind of help us go beyond the map and interpret the trends and, uh, and the information we see in the map. So that, that is what spatial analysis is. And that's sort of the, the framework of what, you, what we do that we have developed our classes, our courses around. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I don't see the slides um, progressing on my end. Thank you. All right, so, you know, space analysis, you know, it, you know, it started back in, in really 1854. Anytime you take a geography or a GIS class, you're gonna hear about John Snow's famous cholera map. And this is where, um, at the time, cholera was thought to be a, uh, an airborne pathogen. And, um, and people were getting sick by, by breathing bad air. And um, there was an outbreak in London. That's the map you see up there on, on the left-hand side. 
And uh, John Snow, who's also also known as the father of, of epidemiology, actually plotted the cases. And those are the black dots you kind of see there. And uh, so this is the kind of the first use of spatial analysis is mapping the data. And uh, and John believed that, uh, or I say Dr. Snow believed that um, it was more a waterborne disease. So he mapped the cases and he he was able to show that they were all clustering around a water pump. And you see that on, on the right-hand side where people would go and get their water, their drinking water. And people that live closest to that pump used that pump. And that's where the, um, and that's where a lot of the cases were clustering around. He, um, he dismantled the pump, took the handle off the pump and, uh, and the cases um, went away. And that was sort of the first evidence that um, not only the first evidence of using spatial analysis in epidemiology and public health, but um, one of the first convincing evidences that uh, that cholera was a waterborne disease. Next slide, please. So now we can fast forward a century, okay? And this is a project that uh, Tim and I have been involved in here at the school. And this is uh, mapping malaria risk in, in Southern Africa. So you see some maps up here and um, what you see is on the left-hand side is the maps of malaria risk. So we collected data on people that tested positive for malaria and and in what their surround characterized their surrounding environments, and we were able to use that information then to predict the risk of malaria at unsampled locations. And then we did that for the dry season and both the rainy season as well. And then you also see accompanying a map of prediction uncertainty. So this is sort of what now spatial analysis can look like compared to what John Snow was doing back in the day. Um, but again, it's, it's all based on spatial data, getting that data information, GIS to help us integrate and map the data, and then spatial statistics enables to do interesting things like predict risk and, and risk uncertainty and, and so forth. So, um, so a, lot, a lot of the current stuff looks like this in terms of spatial analysis. Next slide, please. Well, you can see a lot of spatial analysis in the general media, and, and this isn't just in the last couple of years. This is certainly over, you know, the last decade. We, we're all using location information now. You know, whether it's on our cell phone or on our GPS device, we want to know, you know, directions to go from here to there. Is there traffic and what's near me? So this, the the availability and the accessibility of, of spatial information has really um, exploded over the last decade, decade or so. These are just some examples in the media. You see CDC's um, surveillance reports on flu, you know, and then they show you the progression of flu um, either on a daily or weekly basis through the flu season. Um, the bottom map there is was an interesting article in the New York Times um, that looked at um, endangered species and the stuff we buy. And they kind of map this stuff out in terms of what we buy, where that stuff comes from, and how it affects the ecology of that area. And that was kind of an interesting article and a kind of a unique unique application of some of the tools in, in spatial analysis. Next slide, please. But probably the most current and most powerful example of of spatial analysis is the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard, which I'm sure everybody has seen, maybe not visited directly, but definitely seen it on TV and, it, and it's garnered a lot, a lot of press. And this is what that dashboard looks like. And it looks great. It looks professional. It looks really interesting. Okay. And you can see the dots of where the case is over the world. You can stratify different areas, you can zoom in, all this kind of stuff, and it has some summary plots and summary statistics on here as well. You know, but, but when, when you take all that out, you know, the bottom structure of this is just a posting of our data, posting of the information using maps, okay, where we have the location, whether it's by state, by country, and we can map this information about something so current and important like COVID. And this is probably um, one of the best examples of not only of using spatial analysis, but how powerful maps can be to communicate information um, and vital and, and critical information. And, um, and actually the software that was used to build this dashboard is the same software that you'll learn in the program. It's the ESRI 
product, um, ArcGIS. Um, it goes by Arc Pro now because it's been updated. And, um, and that's what was used to build this dashboard um, at Johns Hopkins. Next slide, please. So why spatial analysis? Well, let me just kind of read off some, um, some quotes here. You know, because the uses of geospatial technology are so widespread and diverse, the market is growing at an annual rate of almost 35%. And when we talk about geospatial technology, a lot of this focuses on well, what are the technology, what are the tools we can use to get spatial information? I mean, we can get spatial information now from our phones using satellite information now is routinely available to the general public and, and the academic research users. We can get that information now. Um, tracking devices uh, that people use for studies. So that's what we mean by geospatial technology. A lot of the data, a lot of the tools we use to collect data, but then GIS is also a part of the technology to integrate all these databases into one system and, and map that data. Um, increasing demand for readily available, consistent, accurate, complete, and current geographic information and the widespread availability and use of advanced technologies, again, those same technologies we talked about, offer great job opportunities for people with many different talents and educational backgrounds. Okay, so when we talk about advanced technologies, now this is also speaking to spatial statistics, that, that set of, that, that area of statistics that is focused on analyzing spatial data. So it doesn't just end with the map. We're able to analyze the trends in the map and make some inferences off that map. So um, a lot of powerful, important reasons why we would want to consider spatial analysis. Next slide, please. This was a, um, an article that, uh, that came out um, about five years ago when we were thinking about putting this program together. It had a really catchy title. What gets measured gets done. And um, that is so true in, in, in a field like public health. If the data is there for it, then people can grab it and use it and analyze that data and help inform public health, whether it's intervention, policy, control, efforts, and, and so forth. So what gets measured means if the data is available for it, then things get worked on. Um, and just to grab a quote from the article that leaders recognize that there is an urgent need for more timely and more, geograph more geographically specific data at the neighborhood or census tract level. So like instead of going to the state level, the country level, we need to focus down to neighborhoods or what's called census tracts to efficiently and effectively address some of the most pressing problems in public health. Because things vary at a spatial level and, and that spatial level they vary are at this neighborhood or more refined census tract level, zip code level, these kind of things, rather than having everything aggregated to a state or region, a country and so forth. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of different careers um, you can go into with a background in spatial analysis, especially one you, you can get from our program here. So there are a number of career paths and, and some of these are narrowly focused and more kind of general encompassing about your field. You know, spatial analysis for public health can be used among other traditional public health careers. So it's not that you'll take this program and you'll want to switch gears completely to, to just focusing on spatial analysis. You can certainly do that. And we've had um, students in the past, graduates in the past that have done that. But I sort of look at spatial analysis sort of as like a benefit added component to your current career, right? So now you can sort of add the skill set of, of being a spatial analyst and just some possible job titles, you know, environmental health officer, a GIS software developer, cartography and visualization specialist, you know, a GIS scientist, geospatial data administrator, and even a spatial statistician based on, um, based on the tools that you learn in our program. And uh, Tim just recently put together a summary of um, where some of our graduates have gone in terms of jobs and so forth. And, uh, and uh, maybe you can ask a question in the chat and we'd be happy to talk about um, some of that. Next slide, please. So here's some of the program details, right? So we have a master's of applied science and spatial analysis for public health, okay? And that is 15 and a half credits and there are four terms. So, act, so um, there are four terms of two academic years. So Hopkins is in 
terms, not semesters, right? So there's two semesters a year. Hawkins has four terms per year. So there are two terms per each semester. And the courses cover um, not only the, um, the spatial courses and the epi and the biosat courses, but there's also professional development courses and this integrative activity, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but we also have a one-year graduate certificate in spatial analysis for public health. And these for students that come to the program, they already have the necessary biostatistics background, and they also have the um, also have an epi background, a background in epidemiology, and they just don't have the spatial analysis. So they can take some of the um, spatial analysis courses, 18 credits worth, and get a certificate. And that can be done in one year. Um, all our learning is skill-based orientation for, it, it's designed for working professionals. It's part-time, 100% online. And we take very much an instructional approach that's both targeted and current. So, you know, there's a lot of group learning, peer assessment. It's all based on application and skills-oriented, hands-on um, hands learning. You know, so it's, it's a lot less of what you might see in, usual undergraduate or graduate courses where, you know, okay, we'll have an exam next week on chapters three to five. No, it's more project-based because we want you to learn the material through application. Um, and we focus on both local and global issues. And, and our ultimate goal is to prepare students to address public health problems through this multidisciplinary approach that applies the latest scientific knowledge. A lot of what we're doing now, uh, people are doing now, it's, it's very multidisciplinary. You, you might have went to school for one thing, but you're working in an environment where you have to collaborate with people from other skill sets and so forth. And spatial analysis really kind of fits that paradigm really well. Next slide, please. So this is actually the specific curriculum. OK, and you can see and this is the curriculum, the excuse me, the curriculum for the two year MAS degree. And, I, and I'll, I'll speak in a minute about what the um, certificate has. So you see year one and year two, and you see each year is split up into those four terms, okay? So they're like eight week terms. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this every, every line by line, but I just wanna highlight the spatial courses. So like in year one, in terms one and two, you'll get spatial analysis for public health, which kind of introduces you to the GIS software. Um, and then you also have a course on spatial data technologies for mapping. So this is, talking about all the technologies out there where we can go and get the data, whether you get it through um, the census, whether you get it through other websites, whether you get data off your cell phone, tracking device, satellite information, um, and so forth. And so we'll have a course dedicated to that as well. And then the other two terms in the year one are your EPI and your Biostat classes. Um, and then in your second year, you continue with the statistics and the epidemiology. And then in terms three and four, these are your last, two terms of the program for the for the masters, you're, you're coming back to more of the um, GIS, but now focusing on spatial statistics. So we have an applied spatial statistics course, a spatial analysis journal club course. And then in the last term of your second year, there's a spatial applications course. And that course is, is a very much of an application-based course where you're kind of given problems to work on, but you have to work on everything that you've learned in the program thus far. Um, at the end there, you see an integrative activity course. So there is an integrative activity project that is due for the MAS program at the end of your second year. And we actually have a course for it. And that's sort of like your capstone or your thesis. And, um, and what's really interesting about the integrative activity that kind of sets our program apart, a lot of things set our program apart. But one of, the, one of the features is this integrative activity. We allow students to bring in their own data, their own problem, if they want to to work on as part of their capstone, or not part of, but as for their, their capstone, for their integrative activity um, assignment. And this is, this is written like a, like a manuscript, like a publication that, that will focus on spatial analysis. So we allow students to bring in their own data, which a lot have taken advantage of, but that's not a requirement. For those who do not have their own data or their own data, just it just didn't turn out to be feasible to bring in their own data, we provide data sets for students to grab and build off their own hypotheses and design and follow that through for, um, for the integrative activity. Um, the certificate program has the same spatial curriculum as the master's, okay? So the, the certificate 
students would take in terms one and two, spatial analysis for public health, spatial data technologies, and then they would take the um, applied spatial statistics courses in terms three and spatial applications in terms four. The, um, the certificate um, students do not do a, an integrative activity. So, um, so it's all here. You can go online and look at the specific details of each course, more, more descriptions about them. And I mentioned that the, the integrative activity um, part where you're able to bring in your own data, that, that's sort of a, um, something that's novel and unique about our program. What also is unique about our program is dedicated instruction in spatial statistics. A lot of programs out there will talk about getting spatial data and all the different spatial data technologies and focus on GIS as a, um, as a mapping tool, which it is a very good mapping tool and also to integrate data from various sources. Um, but a lot of programs will not go much beyond just the GIS start, um, GIS part. Our program has dedicated coursework in this field of, of spatial statistics, which is uh, definitely a unique component for our program. Next slide. So, you know, online learning at, at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, you know, we've been doing this forever. It seems like 20 plus years experience in, in online learning. Um, and this is before we had any of the OPAL programs out there. We've been doing online learning for a very long time and it's a, it's, it's, it's a very structured and developed component of the School of Public Health. The courses are developed with high production value. Our entire basement at the school is studios where we as faculty go in and we record lectures and, um, and then the editing team takes that and really makes them at a high production value. Um, and there's a lot of activities in our online courses to keep students engaged throughout the program. So it's not just that you go and listen to the lectures. Um, we have live talks where for the spatial classes, Tim and I will come and join, kind of like what we're joining here now. Um, and we just hear and talk to students live back back and forth about um, different assignments and, and so forth. Um, our, re, our lectures are all recorded um, and provided for increased flexibility. There's a 24 seven help desk, um, which, is, which is really convenient. And another, another um, good selling point about our program is we have two teaching assistants that are permanent teaching assistants for all your courses in spatial analysis. So if you're in the MAS or you're in the certificate program, you will see the same two TAs, okay, Annie Corrigan and Anton Kivett for all your spatial courses, which is really nice because you get to learn them, they get to learn you and, um, and you'll see them either for your entire year for the certificate or your entire two years for the, um, for the MAS. And we always get such great reviews about them and they've been so extremely helpful to making the program successful. Next slide, please. So here is us. Okay, there's me in the upper left-hand corner. You see Tim down at the bottom in the middle there. Um, the rest, uh, and then Tim and I uh, focus on all the spatial courses. Okay, so we run all the spatial courses that, that you'll have in, in the program. Um, Elizabeth Gollop on, on the top there in the middle, she is an epidemiologist and she is also the director of all of the OPAL programs. I just direct the, the spatial analysis program. We have about six or seven other OPAL programs that Liz is sort of the director for that whole educational um, paradigm. John McGreedy up in the top right, he's your biostatistician. He's a great, great instructor. Um, and you'll have him for your two biostat classes. And then um, at the bottom, Derek and Aruna, those are also epidemiologists. And uh, together with Liz, they teach a lot of the epi classes and, and some of the professional development classes. Um, so that's us. I think this ends my portion of the, of the presentation. So I'll hand it back over to Kelly. Uh, thank you for sharing a great insight uh, into different aspects of the program and the need for these skill sets. So I'm going to uh, cover the admission requirements. Um, we do use a centralized application portal called SOFIS for the master's program and SOFIS Express uh, for the graduate certificates. We do require a bachelor's degree from an accredited uh, university or college. Uh, looking for sufficient prior quantitative coursework 
or evidence of quantitative ability, you would upload a resume um, or CV. The master's program requires three letters of recommendation, uh, while the certificate requires one. Uh, the statement of purpose is an important part of your file, it needs to show on um, the co compatibility of your career goals with the educational objectives of the program. So this is your opportunity to explain um, why this program speaks to you and how this will be helpful uh, in your career. For our international students, uh, if English is not your first language, you may need um, an exam um, and showing your uh, proficiency in English. And for any coursework earned outside of the United States, we do need a course by course evaluation. We recommend using WES or World Education Service. Uh, if you've already had your uh, courses evaluated by a different agency, we do have a list of approved um, agencies. Uh, once a file is complete, either in SOFIS or SOFIS Express, it does go over to the admission committee. They, re re they do review files, completed files on an ongoing basis. We encourage candidates to apply early. Uh, the deadline for the master's program is uh, June 1st, and the certificate uh, final deadline is July 1st. Uh, we have one start a year. It's every fall. Uh, so we uh, are already working with students now uh, on uh, helping them complete their file uh, and students already waiting for uh, acceptance decisions. So our tuition is currently 1,197. The OPAL scholarship is 460. Uh, everyone who is accepted into the program receives the OPAL scholarship. So there's no additional application steps required to receive the OPAL scholarship. That does bring the cost down to 737 per credit hour after the OPAL scholarship is applied. And so for the master's at 50.5 credits, um, the investment would be 37,218 currently. And for the graduate certificate at 18 credits, the investment would be 18,425. Uh, we do uh, reassess tuition and the OPAL scholarship each spring, and that will be posted um, on the website. Uh, you do pay for the credits or courses as you take them in each eight week term. Uh, financial aid is certainly an option uh, for the master's program. Uh, the contact information for financial aid uh, is on this screen. Uh, if you um, are uh, needing our uh, school code, it is E as an excellent 00234. And our financial aid office is there to assist students um, with the financial aid doc documents and questions about financial aid. Uh, so now we're going to open up the time for questions. And if you haven't typed in your question, please do so now. Um, I'll answer questions about uh, admission requirements, and Frank and Tim will address any questions on the program. So I'm looking at our questions now. Okay, the first question, it seems like the concentration of the program is around the spatial uh, statistics toolbox rather than the general overview of common geoprocessing tools. Is that right? Or will there be coverage in other tools as well? I think Tim and I can answer this one together. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier. So all your geoprocessing will be done in Arc Pro. And I know there was a question later on too. I looked at the Q&A. Is this in ArcGIS or, or is this in ArcMap or 
or ArcGIS Pro. We, we now teach everything in Arc Pro. Um, and also all your geo, geo processing will be done in, in Arc Pro. All the spatial statistics is done in the programming language called R. People might've heard of this. Um, you do not need prior knowledge coming um, of R coming into the program. We provide the necessary um, information to get people started in R. And um, the reason why we do a lot of it in R because a prepackaged software like um, Arc Pro, although it, it continues to update their, their capacity to do spatial analysis and spatial statistical analysis, um, it is limited and, and it's usually behind um, what is currently available out there. And R, the programming language R is, is updated by, by users in a sense. And um, so we have a lot more flexibility with R. So all the statistical analysis we do on the maps is done in R. Tim, did you want to add a little bit more to that? Uh, I, I guess the one point I wanted to make sure is clear is that um, we have a university site license for ArcGIS. So I know, um, you, you know you get free access to the software that way. Um, and, and like Frank said, yeah, we do uh, the basic, or you know, I don't know, if they, that's certainly the basic, if not beyond the uh, geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS Pro. Um, and, and I did see something further down here, I guess while we're on the topic in the chat box about, uh, had something to do about these dashboards. And yeah, is there a certificate for any coverage on how about how to go about dashboards like COVID dashboards. In our second class, Spatial Data Technologies, we touch on web mapping and we, we share maps. And that's kind of the start of how you would put these dashboards together. Uh, but we do not, you know, concentrate on building the dashboards. Um, but I wanted to at least mention that. Uh, so I, I guess that's it for me there, Brian. Okay, the next question is, can a person start with a certificate and later decide if they want to continue on and pick up those classes that are in the master's program? So I'm gonna say no initially. And the reason why is because um, a student may apply for the certificate program and, and we look at the applications very closely and we may look at that the background of that student and, and go back and say, listen, you, you don't have the prerequisite bio statistics in EPI. Um, would you be more inclined to take the, the, MA, the MA, MAS program, the two-year program? Um, and likewise, if somebody comes in with the MAS and they have a lot of bio statistics background and, and EPI background, we might say, listen, a lot of that might be redundant for you. Maybe you just want to take the certificate program. Um, so, so that certainly happens. Um, but we also, um, and Kelly, you know, on your end, you may get inquiries from students um, about, well, is this enough background and, and, and so forth? And they want to talk to somebody with a little bit more. So um, I talk to students a lot before they apply, you know, um, whether it's an email or we have a phone conversation to go over what their background is and, and help them decide what is most appropriate, either the, the MAS or the, or the certificate program. Yeah, I think that's a, a very helpful for students trying to decide between the two. Yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out because we're, we're more than happy um, to, to talk with you, again, email or phone to, to help you decide what, what is best for you. Um, I think this next question I can answer. Uh, I, the question is, I heard four terms a year. So is that by quarters then? How long is each term? So each term um, is eight weeks long. Uh, so you almost have like a fall one, fall two, spring one, spring two. That's one way to look at it. And uh, just to let you know that there is flexibility in the master's program that if you did not want to do two classes in each eight week term, um, you have the flexibility of taking one class and graduating up to four years. The next question is for the data studied in the program, is it US focused or globally focused? We try to bring in a lot of studies that are international. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I, I think, it, I think it's a, a healthy mix. Um, you'll see a lot of this, very, especially your first two terms with Tim in, in the spatial analysis and GIS classes. 
um, where some of, some of the data are international. Um, when it comes to the spatial statistics, um, we try our best. Sometimes data is limited um, internationally, but, um, but yeah, again, it's a mix of both. Um, and I think I mentioned this local in terms of US based and global in terms of um, across the whole world. All right, thank you. Uh, are the biostats classes calculus based? No, they're not, which is probably a leaf to, to the person who answered and everybody else who's listening. Uh, <laughs> they um, obviously having um, some math background is, is essential. And these are statistics classes, but no, it does not use um, a lot of information from calculus. So you don't need a prerequisite um, of calculus. And I hear great feedback um, from uh, students um, with our statistics professor. Yeah, John McGreedy, I, like I mentioned, he, he's a great, he's won a lot of awards. They call him the Golden Apple Awards here. Um, and he he's probably has a shelf collection of those um, that's given to one instructor per year per course size. And he teaches a lot of the bigger classes um, in biostatistics. So he's, yeah, he, he's good. You're, you're in good hands with John. Next question is, what's the typical background demographic and experience of the students that apply to the program? You know, it's a, it's a very big eclectic mix. You know, we have people from all different walks of life and, uh, and, and, prior, and, and definitely with prior experience of, of students. I know Tim tracks these students a little bit better than I. Um, so Tim, I'll let you say a few words on that. And I also saw that somebody did ask us to maybe go into that summary of where students might have been the graduates. So Tim, maybe you can um, follow up with that one as well. Sure, I'll start by saying, yeah, the, the, the background of students really runs the gamut. Um, some are kind of just out of college and uh, like undergrad and they, and they jump into this. Others have, you know, 20, 30 years of experience um, working in the field even, and, uh, you know, public health kind of field, you know, maybe with some health department. And, and they come to kind of, you know, uh, augment their, their uh, skill set. So, um, and some come with a health related background, you know, working uh, in a health related field. Others um, are totally different. Like there's a banker who just wanted to change into to a health related field. Um, so that varies. And, you know, uh, it varies with GIS experience. You know, I'm used to having uh, little to no experience in the students with GIS and we start from scratch, but um, now I'm getting students who have a geography background, who have GIS courses. So it, it, it runs the gamut. Um, there's a, an element here that we really haven't touched on is um, these students, when they, these cohorts, especially when they start, we, they, they form this network. You know, we kind of foster this throughout the courses and there's a lot of dialogue between us and the students, but there's also dialogue amongst the students. So uh, pretty quick, they start formulating ties with each other. And this diversity of background and experience really is, is valuable because, um, you know, everybody's sharing their experience. So it kind of really broadens what, you, what even we bring to the course, the, the students themselves bring a lot to it. So um, that's worth noting as well. Um, so in terms of the career paths, you know, Frank and I often get uh, request, hey, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a job. Uh, can I get a, a reference from you? That kind of thing. And and so I kind of like keep note of that. I kind of like make a, a little file and I say, you know, who, who's applying for what kind of jobs. So I kind of, you know, can give you some rough sketches of that. You know, um, like some of this, the roles that I see in, in from these students, you know, um, they're statisticians. I, somebody just got a job as a uh, spatial statistician. There's a lot of GIS or data analysts or and or I should say. Um, Faculty, people go on to faculty in, in research positions. And, you know, and there's people working as epidemiologists for various organizations. I was just kind of, kind of grouping these. Um, like in the kind of the public sector, I, I see people going to the CDC, Department of Homeland Security, Public Health Institute Tracking uh, Center in California, various universities either working at or, or being in the faculty there. Um, and as, and as well as people just continuing on for uh, PhD work. And that there's also people going into the private industries, uh, working with utilities, a lot of, uh, or a couple, I shouldn't say a lot, but a few uh, big data um, kind of groups. Um, one with uh, opioids, I know the other was with uh, an, on an oncology warehouse. 
uh, and consultant groups. So students come here, uh, some with some experience they want to augment, some with a career change in mind. And it really, um, it, there's a wide range of what they do with this, this, uh, this program, this degree. Uh, this next question ties in a little bit with what you're talking about. They wanted to know uh, different career paths between a GIS student versus a spatial analysis student. Yes, yeah, so I guess that, and then and I'll, I'll go first and then I'll let Tim follow up. I, sometimes they're, they're one and the same. You know, when you talk about GIS and you talk about spatial analysis, it, it really depends on how you define spatial analysis. I think historically, Spatial analysis was just working in GIS and where the end product would be the map. Um, and, as a, and like I mentioned, as a novel part of our program, we have this component of spatial statistics, which takes the map as a starting point, you know, and then we, then we do all that analysis and interpretation of, of, the, of the patterns in the map. So when you define spatial analysis to include spatial statistics, um, they're a lot different. And I think you would be a lot more attractive and can get jobs that are more or that require more of an analytical skill set, you know, rather than just um, just um, data manipulations to get to get to a map. Um, so that, that that's how I would look at the difference between a GIS based program and an hour spatial analysis program. Sure. I don't have too much to add to that, but it's maybe maybe a slight uh, anecdotal story. Um, you know. I, I do a lot of work in uh, Zambia with malaria research and with the COVID outbreak, uh, the Zambian government was interested in creating a dashboard similar to what uh, Frank showed. Um, and they asked me if I would help advise and, 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 and get them rolling with that. So um, I, was, I would join the meetings with, with the group and we start talking and um, there's another organization there from South Africa who was helping out. And one of our Opal alums um, who took our program maybe two years ago uh, he's working, doing some health-related, you know, public health uh, field collection kind of data for for a private company, and he was brought in. So it was really fun for me uh, on these Zoom calls to uh, reconnect with him. Um, and at that time, he had not much experience creating dashboards. He had uh, GIS under his belt. He had this the uh, spatial statistics under his belt, and and so we we're talking about that. But um, he was not well versed in in dashboards, but he felt equipped or uh, adequate enough to, to tackle this. And that dashboard that Frank showed, the architecture behind it, the mechanics behind it, isn't, isn't tremendously difficult to understand. Um, you know, we, you set up maps, you pump it through a web mapper onto this dashboard, and then you, you set your settings. And so um, that was kind of the least of it, was creating the dashboard. Um, but understanding the data going through it is, is the key thing. But um, just a quick story. I've, you know, in a, in a very fun manner for me, uh, reconnected with one of the uh, past students. And just to follow up on, on, on what Tim was saying there, that is, you know, with, with our program, you will learn a lot, okay? Um, so that when you're out on your own and something like, oh, dashboards now are popular and people want to build dashboards, you have the necessary background and the foundation to go and learn something like that on your own because it wasn't that much of a stretch. I mean, it looks like it's a stretch, but once you have a lot of the, the GIS programming background, um, you can go and you can you know, search up and find out how to do this on your own. And, th and that can be said about a lot of the, a, a lot of things that might come up post-graduation where we, we provide enough of the foundation um, for you to go in and tackle those things on your own. Because the field is evolving. You know, be before COVID, Dashboards were here before COVID, but nobody really knew about them. And but now everybody knows about them, and everybody wants to build a dashboard for whatever they're working on. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys answer this question. Uh, they were wanting to know, like, between each eight-week term, uh, how much of a break there is. Yeah. So in the fall, there's like a long weekend. I think maybe a Friday and or a Monday. Okay, so you take your eight weeks and then you just have maybe a day and a weekend off and then you start your next eight weeks and that takes you to the um, to the Christmas holiday. So that kind of keeps you on tap with a semester. Right. So we'll end somewhere around, you know, Tim, help me out, like December 18th, 19th, December 
18th, 19th, usually right, right there. Yeah, it will end. And then, um, and then we break for um, a couple weeks, you know, in middle January or middle to later January, um, we'll start up again. And then you'll have your next eight weeks. Um, and then between that third and fourth term of the spring side, um, there is a spring break in between the two terms. And Frank, also to cap that off, the summer months are off. Yes. So the, uh, the fourth term ends in um, early May, mid-May or so. Mid and, then, so yeah. and then um, and term one begins uh, around Labor Day, September. So uh, you, you get June, July, August uh, as, as downtime as well. OK, I have a question if the GRE or GMAT is required, and that is not um, part of our application requirements. Uh, here is a great question. Um, are there any networking opportunities within the program? Sure, I mean, students take, I mean, we, we've heard as faculty that, that students went ahead and developed their own Facebook page for, for their cohort. Um, and they do a lot of discussions there, which probably start out with more things along the lines of, hey, is anybody able to do this part of the assignment or, and that kind of stuff? But I think it leads to um, long-term friendships and connections and, and networking. Tim mentioned there is a LinkedIn page um, for the program. So, um, so when people graduate, they can still stay connected. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 there are those opportunities and a lot of them have been initiated by, by the students. Tim, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I, I would like to add one other component. You know, as a student at the School of Public Health, um, you know, you have access to, and you know, a lot of our lectures now, all of our special lectures are on Zoom, so it's uh, added access, I guess, in that sense. But um, so there's the whole faculty at Hopkins, you know, uh, and if there's faculty working in an area of interest for you, um, you know, students have engaged with faculty to, you know, ask if they needed help with research and. and um, things like that. So there's even uh, access to some faculty that, you know, if it works out, then students can um, gain some research directly from other faculty as well. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Tim. And, uh, you know, we're all online now, you know, um, but um, before COVID and, and hopefully um, not too much longer, we will all be back in person um, and, and except for the, uh, for this online program, but the online students are no different than the in-house students. Um, you know, you're, you'll get the same email invitations to either attend seminars or look at seminars and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, you're, you're thrown in the mix as just a Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health student. Um, so there's, there's not a difference between an, an OPAL student and, uh, and an in-house student or anything like that. Yeah, and I can add a little bit to that as well. I'm with students close to when registration or class start, and then there's somebody on our team that has the bandwidth for registration questions um, that picks up from there. So you have a, a, a lot of support on that side of it. Uh, and I do hear back from students just to let me know how much they like the program, um, the relationships that they develop with the professors or fellow classmates, uh, and so much so that um, there's a fair number of students that actually come to campus uh, to walk for graduation. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Thanks, Kelly. We have, um, and we have, uh, a, you know, like we have the celebration the night before graduation and uh, um, where we get all the Opal students together. And uh, it's really, it's really a nice opportunity for us. And I think for students as well to actually meet face to face. Uh, and did we, have we touched on yet um, the experience requirement for the program? Um, work experience or ac other academic experience? Uh, work experience. Yeah, no, there is no work experience requirement for the program. Like Tim was saying, sometimes we get students that come right out of undergrad. Um, and sometimes we have people that haven't sat in a class for 20 or 30 years. And, um, and so it's fine. And, uh, and yeah, so there, there is no work experience requirement. Thanks for answering that. Another question just came in. I think I can answer this. Someone wanted just to, to clarify that um, the master's program was completely online. Um, yes, it, the, both the graduate certificate and the master's programs are completely online. Yes, that, 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 that's so. 
However, in the past, we have had students that are close enough in proximity to the school and asked if they could stop by. And of course they can, you know, if they wanted to meet with a TA actually in person or meet with Tim and I in person, that, that's certainly fine. And we've had a handful of, uh, every year we seem to have one or two that are in close enough proximity to Baltimore that have stopped by. And actually one um, was traveling from Arizona to South Carolina and detoured through Baltimore just to pop in to, uh, to chat with us, which was nice. Uh, and I think we have time for one last question. Uh, some examples of the integrative activity that students have done in the past. Ah, great question. Um, we, we should have a slide listing some of this stuff. So Tim, I'll, I'll ask for help on this one as well, since your memory is a lot better than mine. Um, the data sets we provide, and again, we provide students to data set. We provide one on air pollution. Um, we provide one on... Um, food desert mapping. And then we provide another data set on health outcomes at a uh, census track level. And students can go and, and do whatever they want with that. We've had some really interesting um, studies that people have done. Um, I, I, one that sticks in my mind was getting data from Twitter and, and trying to analyze um, Twitter data. And this was in reaction to the shooting in Las Vegas, you know, looking at before and after that event um, and so forth. Tim, do you remember other ones? Somebody else was developing a cool technique to mine Twitter data for opioids, uh, posting posts on, on tweets on opioid use and mapping that. Um, and I know uh, I was thinking back about a, a survey one of the students um, put out in, in an area in, uh, in Germany where she was living and looking at physical um, uh, physical transportation, like riding bikes and, and walking related to environmental covariates, um, socioeconomic covariates. So uh, they're cool. And I know, I'm trying to think, think of some of the international ones, you know, uh, I'm trying to, I'm drawing a blank on some of them because they were now a couple of years ago, but um, they really kind of run the gamut. Uh, a lot of people do pick some of the, the prepackaged data sets that you have um, to kind of get around some of the, the data acquisition issues that, you know, is always a challenge. But, um, and I do know actually a couple was, was down in a health department down in South Carolina and utilizing their, uh, their county data and, and mapping that out. And I think that was talking about use of opioid clinics and um, access to care there. And, and the, guy, you... the guy from, who, from South Africa did a uh, an evaluation of a drone vaccine or blood gathering system. Um, that's what he ended up doing his uh, integrative activity on. And let me, let me just follow up with the integrative activity because I, I, I didn't have time to mention it before. But, um, you know, so it, it's only for those in the two year master's program. And you start working on your integrative activity at the end of year one. So there's two additional spatial classes for the MAS students. They're just called spatial labs one and two. And we have these in different terms. So student can be, so students can stay abreast of GIS and spatial analysis skills and not let a lot of time go by until they have another one of the core courses. And a part of those labs also is to get students started on their integrative activity. So before your first summer, at the end of your first year, we have you starting to think about, there's actually an assignment that has you start thinking about possible integrative activity assignments and how would you proceed with it. And then we provide some guidance over the summer. And then you take the second lab course, which is your second year, second term. So this is November and December of your second year. And that's when you start actually working with your integrative activity data. Okay, and it, and it could be either your own data or you start working with some of the data we provide. So you're working on this continuously throughout your program. So when you get to that last term of your second year and there is that course for integrative activity, you've done a lot of the preparing so far of that analysis and pretty much you can just run, use that course to, to analyze the data and get support for analysis of, of the, that data and then write up the results. 
But thank you. I think that uh, provides a lot of great information on the integrated activity and how, how that works and when they start. Well, it looks like that is all the time we have for today. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending, for joining us. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, um, our team in admissions will contact you in the next few days. Uh, you can reach me directly um, for further information on the program or admission steps. My contact information is on this last slide. Uh, if you're excited about the program and see this as a part of your future, uh, please feel free to use the scan codes here to move forward with your application. We do have a dedicated admission team uh, looking forward to working with you. Uh, Frank or Tim, any closing words? Um, it, it, was, it was a pleasure having this opportunity to talk to you about spatial analysis. Um, again, if you have any questions, you know, um, start off with Kelly and the admissions office, and um, it wouldn't take you very long to get to us if there are specific questions about um, background, prerequisites, and, and so forth. We're happy to talk to any, any prospective students on, on, on a variety of subjects. I'll just do all that and say uh, pleasure uh, having a time to explain our program to you. Thank you. Thank you again.